Hello everyone, kamusta? I hope you're all doing fine. Welcome back to the channel. This is the House of Law. Thank you very much for your support, for watching my videos, and for subscribing to this channel. If you are new to the channel, I am Attorney Al Jumrani and I make videos about the law, about law subjects, and about law-related issues. So if you are enjoying your time here in my channel, please don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case I upload a new video. So for today, I have decided to make a video that will help our bar reviewees who are reviewing very hard for the 2021 bar exams this coming November. And also this may be helpful for law students and undergrad students who have business law courses. Now, if you're also watching this without any background on law, I hope you will find this helpful for you to understand better our topic. And our topic today is obligations and contracts. But this is just part one of this topic. We will just talk about obligations and contracts will be for the part two of this video. So if you're ready, let's begin. So what are obligations? An obligation is a juridical necessity to give, to do, or not to do. Now this definition may seem to be very simple, but it's also the most uh, difficult to understand because it is not just an obligation to do, to give, or not to do, but rather there are elements to this obligation. And what are these elements? Well, first, there must be a juridical tie. And uh, this juridical tie is the legal or juridical relationship. But whose relationship? It's the relationship between the active subject and the passive subject. The active subject is the obligee or the creditor. He is the party who has the right to demand the performance of the obligation. He is all, now, the next party is the passive subject. He is the obligor or debtor. He is the party who has the duty to perform the obligation. Now, what obligation? That is the fourth element, and it is the prestation or the obligation to be performed. So if all these elements are present, then it is a valid and legal obligation. But what are the sources of obligations? Well, we have five. First, we have the law. Next, contracts, quasi-contracts, quasi-delicts, and delicts. Well, law, of course, is the general term given to those enactments by Congress and also the rules, regulations, and policies of the duly constituted authorities. Examples of obligations arising from law are the obligation to pay taxes, and also the obligation to give support as provided under the Family Code. Now, for contracts, some of the obligations that come from um, common contracts like contract of sale, contract of lease, and contract of loan, are the obligations to deliver property, obligations to pay back a loan, or, to, or the obligation to pay rent, okay, because these arise from contract. Now, quasi-contracts are those arrangements or relationships created by law in order to uh, prevent unjust enrichment. So these contracts or quasi-contracts contemplate a situation where one person is benefited by the efforts or by the work of another person are also benefited because of mistake, such as when uh, a person receives something that is not due him. So what are these quasi-contracts? So the first example that I gave, where a person is benefited by the work of another, that's negotiorum hesjo. The other is uh, one, when one person is benefited by mistake, as when he receives something which is not due him, that is solution in debity. Okay, so in quasi-contracts, you will note that the law imposes the obligation to return the money, as in the case of solution indebity, or to pay just compensation to the person who caused uh, the, the other party some benefit. Now, the next source of obligations are quasi-delics. And in quasi-delics, a person who, through his negligent acts, committed or caused injury to another, so the law creates the obligation to pay the injured person damages or some compensation. Next are the delicts, and delicts are acts or omissions punishable by law. In other words, crimes. Now, under Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code, a person who is criminally liable is also civilly liable. But this only applies to those crimes which have a private complainant or if there is a victim. So in those crimes where there are no private complainants, in other words, the victimless crimes, 
there is no obligation to pay damages or to pay any amount. Examples of victimless crimes are violations of the Dangerous Drugs Act, violations of um, laws on morality such as uh, indecent publication and prostitution. Okay, note that the source of the obligation must contemplate an active subject and the obligation must either be the payment of a sum of money or the performance of an act or deed. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Now let's look at kinds of obligations. So we begin with the pure and conditional obligations. So the pure obligations are the most common and the default obligations because when an obligation is created, the expectation is that the obligation will be performed immediately or at once. Thus, a pure obligation is defined as that whose effectivity or extinguishment does not depend upon the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of a condition or upon the expiration of a term or period. Thus, it is demandable at once. Conditional obligations, on the other hand, are those whose effectivity depends upon the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of a future and uncertain fact or event. So if you are to define what a condition is, to make it a conditional obligation, so it is a future or an uncertain fact or event. It may or it may not happen. And so it's happening or it's non-happening will greatly affect the performance of the obligation. But by default, if there are no conditions attached, obligations are pure and demandable at once. So what are the kinds of conditions? Well, there are two major conditions. We have suspensive conditions, and uh, as the name suggests, it suspends the obligation. A suspensive condition is a condition, the fulfillment of which gives rise to an obligation of the party in whose favor the condition is created. So in case of a creditor-debtor relationship and a condition is imposed, to be fulfilled by the debtor, if that suspensive condition is not fulfilled, then the obligation of the creditor does not arise. The example would be in a contract to sell. In a contract to sell, the creditor there is the seller. His obligation is to sell the property to the buyer. But the buyer is subject or is bound to perform a suspensive condition. And that suspensive condition is the full payment of the purchase price. If the purchase price is not fulfilled, then the obligation to sell does not arise. In other words, the buyer must first pay the purchase price in full before the creditor or the seller is bound to sell to him the property. Next the group of conditions would be the resolutory conditions. A resolutory condition is one which extinguishes rights and obligations already existing. So in this type of conditions, an obligation is already binding, valid, binding, and existing. But the resolutory condition may terminate it may, or may extinguish it. A good example would be a pact to the retro sale or a sale with right of repurchase, whereby the sale is already valid, the buyer acquires the property, he already enjoys it as an owner, but his right to the property may be extinguished if the seller exercises his right of repurchase. But if he doesn't or he fails to exercise his right of repurchase, then his, the buyer's right to the property is consolidated because that resolutory condition was subject to an expiration, was subject to a term or a period. If it did not happen or if it did not or if it was not fulfilled, then the resolutory condition is also extinguished. Okay. Now what is a potestative condition? Related to or similar to a suspensive condition, a potestative condition is one that depends upon the exclusive will of one of the parties. So it may or it may not happen depending on the will, the decision or the discretion of the uh, person concerned. An example would be, let's say, it is problem A promised to sell to B his car if A decides to go to law school. The potestative condition there is the decision to go to law school. That is solely within or upon the exclusive will of A. Now, according to Article 1182, a potestative condition is void. 
it is void for obvious reasons. It violates the mutuality, it, viola it violates the autonomy, as well as the obligatoriness of contracts. Because it leaves the efficacy of that condition or that obligation upon the will of just one party. Note, however, that where the potestative condition is imposed not on the birth of the obligation but on its fulfillment, only the condition is avoided, leaving unaffected the obligation itself. So, for example, in a contract of law where A borrowed money from B with the obligation, of course, of A to pay back the money. But then, in uh, the contract, A stipulated that he will pay B the loan if he feels like it or only when he feels like it. So there is a potestative condition there and that potestative condition is the payment of the loan if he feels like it. The contract of loan is already valid and binding. There was a delivery of the money. It was received by the borrower. Most probably the borrower has already used it. But the performance or the fulfillment, which is the repayment of the loan, is now subject to a potestative condition. And here, as apply, uh, apply Article 1182, that suspensive, uh, that potestative condition is void. It will be nullified, but because it is attached to the obligation, the contract is still valid. The contract remains, the potestative condition is disregarded, and now the creditor can collect or demand the payment of the obligation. Okay, now let's talk about obligations with a period. Obligation with a period is one whose consequences are subjected to the expiration of a period or a term. In other words, the debtor is given time or an opportunity to uh, perform the obligation, not at the time of the execution of the contract, but at a later time. So the period or the term is agreed upon by the parties. For example, the price in a contract of sale payable in installment where the seller gave the buyer, uh, let's say, 10 months to pay the installments of uh, the purchase price, which is, let's say, 100,000 pesos. So that means the buyer will pay 10,000 pesos monthly. Now, the obligation is demandable only when the day comes. So in that problem, let's say the buyer uh, asked that he be allowed to pay the installments every fifth day of the month so for example february 5 march 5 uh, april 5 so on and so forth so because it's a period agreed upon by the parties the seller or the creditor cannot demand the payment of the installments at a time different from what was agreed upon and not especially not before the arrival of the day certain which was agreed upon by the parties now, a period is presumed to have been established for the benefit of both creditor and debtor. This means that the debtor cannot pre-terminate the term or cannot cut short the period without the consent of the creditor because the creditor also has some benefit or stake in the period, especially when he derives some income or benefit from the staggered payments, like in a contract of loan. Where the longer the loan is paid, then uh, the more interest he gets. So if the debtor decides to cut short the period, the creditor would lose uh, expected income or profits. In that case, the creditor can impose a pre-termination fee. Next, a potestative condition is different from an obligation with a period. The former is void, but the latter is valid. An example would be, if uh, the obligation begins with an if versus an obligation that begins with a when. Because if it's if, then that means it's entirely upon the sole will or um, uh, decision of the debtor. But when it says when, then it means it depends upon the arrival of a certain time or a certain uh, event or day. So the court may be asked to fix a period in an obligation with a period, especially when the specific period is not agreed upon, but only when something will happen or could happen. Okay, so next, let's look at those instances when the debtor loses the right to use the period. 
So first, when after the obligation has been contracted, he becomes insolvent unless he gives a guarantee or security for the debt. Next, when he does not furnish to the creditor the guarantees or securities which he has promised. Next, when by his own acts he has impaired said guarantees or securities after the establishment. And when through a fortuitous event they disappear unless he immediately gives new ones equally satisfactory. Next is when the debtor violates any undertaking in consideration of which the creditor agreed to the period. And lastly, when the debtor attempts to abscond. Now notice that in all these instances, the debtor commits something or does something that could violate the trust and confidence of the creditor. Well, that is precisely the reason why the debtor was given a period. Normally, a creditor would expect that the debtor would perform his obligation immediately upon the execution of the contract. But the debtor requested for a period and as a consideration for giving him that period the creditor must have some trust and assurance okay? and that trust or assurance could be the capacity or the ability of the debtor or it is based or it is because of some security or collateral given so having said that when the debtor is no longer in a position to pay <clears throat> When the period arrives, or when the collateral that he has given, or the securities that he has uh, uh, provided the creditor have been in impaired, either because they were lost, or because they had been proceeded against by another creditor, then the debtor loses the trust which was given him. Or the creditor now loses the assurance that he will be paid. Thus, the debtor loses the use of the period, and the creditor can demand the full payment of the obligation not just the payment of the partial obligation or the part of the obligation which falls on a certain day but also the payment of the entire obligation and this is what we call the acceleration of the obligation because the debtor has lost the use of the period or has lost the right to use the period Okay, now let's talk about alternative obligations. Now, in alternative obligations, there is more than one obligation. The performance of one is sufficient. This means that at the time of the execution of the contract or the obligation, the creditor is already aware that the debtor will perform or will, uh, is given the chance to perform one or more obligations. And the performance of one is sufficient to extinguish the entire obligation. Here the debtor has the right of election and the choice is effective when it is communicated to the creditor. Now also the creditor may be given the right to choose from these obligations, from these alternative obligations. And if the creditor is given the right of election, the obligation ceases to be alternative from the time the creditor communicates his choice. Okay? Now, if a choice has been made and that obligation is not performed, then the debtor becomes in default or in delay. Okay? Now, he has to ask again the creditor if he will be allowed to perform another obligation. But as a rule, because the debtor has chosen which of these obligations to perform, he has to perform it. And he already forfeits the right to perform the other obligations. Now, distinguish alternative obligations from facultative obligations well a facultative obligation facultative obligation is one where only one prestation has been agreed upon but the debtor may render another in substitution so here there is only one obligation stipulated or agreed upon by the parties from the very beginning but in the contract the debtor is given the chance to give or to perform a substitute under certain situations or circumstances like for example if the thing was lost or if performance is legally or physically impossible in these cases the debtor may be allowed to do or to perform a substitute okay so now let's talk about the uh, case of joint and solidary obligations in the bar exams you will definitely expect uh, well, predominantly, no. most most of the bar exams in the past 
always had a question about joint and solidarity obligations because it's 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 perhaps the most common and uh, hardly understood of the obligations under the civil code so let's try to simplify this and understand this so in joint and solidarity obligations there could be either two or more debtors or two or more creditors but let's just uh, focus this on the more common situation is that, which is that there are two or more debtors so in a joint obligation each obliger answers only for a part of the whole liability in other words let's say there are five debtors each of these debtors will only answer to one-fifth of the obligation and because it's joint all of them should be sued together so that the entire obligation can be collected on the other hand in a solidarity or joint and several obligation that's the other term for solidarity joint and several the relationship between the active and passive subjects is so close that each of them must comply with or demand the fulfillment of the whole obligation so using the first example if there are five debtors and if they are solidary each one of them can be sued for the entire obligation although personally he is only liable for one-fifth of the obligation now under the law in case of doubt whether the obligation is joint or solidary, the presumption is in favor of joint obligations. Why? Because this is less onerous or less burdensome. The rule prefers those contracts which involve less transmission of rights. Or stated differently, the law prefers the less onerous of contracts. But in the following instances, solidarity is presumed. So first, liability for quasi delics particularly under vicarious liability in article 2180 of the civil code vicarious liability refers to the liability of two or more joint tort feasors for the same act and under article 2180 the persons who are vicariously liable are the employers for the negligence of their employees teachers or schools for the negligence of the students, parents, or guardians for the negligence of their children or wards. Okay. Next would be the liability of co-principals in a contract of agency. So in a contract of agency where there are two or more principals, one of them or any of them can be held liable to answer for the damages suffered by the agent in carrying out the agency. <coughs> Next is the liability of partners and the partnership in wrongful acts committed against third persons. So, under Article 1822 and 1823, we have two instances when the partners and the partnership are liable solidarily. And that is when money or property belonging to a third person was misappropriated by either the partnership or the partners, or when there is fault, malice, or negligence, uh, cost to a third person either committed by the partners or by the partnership itself so the, 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 the liability there is solidarity and the third person can sue any of any one of the partners or the partnership next is liability of two or more baileys in accommodatum so in accommodatum if the thing is borrowed by two or more borrowers or baileys and if the thing is lost by one of the baileys all of the baileys or borrowers shall be liable and any one of them can be sued by the bailor for the value of the thing lost lastly would be corporate officers who are solidarily liable with the corporation for the illegal termination of services of employees if they acted with malice or bad faith now generally corporate officers are not liable for uh, damage or injury caused to fellow employees because corporate officers are employees themselves but as corporate officers they are solidarily liable this is for the protection of the employees so that is the case of polymer versus salamudin okay now what are the effects of solidarity obligation so first in active solidarity or where there is solidarity of creditors each creditor is empowered to exercise against the debtor not only the rights which correspond to him, 
but also all the rights which correspond to the other creditors with a consequent obligation to render an accounting of his acts to such creditors. Next is that in passive solidarity or where there is solidarity of debtors, each debtor is liable for the payment of the entire obligation with a consequent right to demand reimbursement from the others for their corresponding shares once payment has been made. Okay, let's try to illustrate this. So in active solidarity, if one creditor among five, let's say, was able to sue on the debt and was able to collect the entire debt or obligation, he shall hold in trust the uh, shares of the other creditors. So again, as I said, uh, there are five creditors, so he is only entitled to one-fifth. But if he is able to collect the entire obligation, he has to hold in trust the four-fifths. In other words, the shares of the other four creditors. He must account for them and must deliver them when so demanded by the other creditors. Now, in passive solidarity, in case there are five debtors, one of them is sued and was ordered to pay the entire obligation. He has the right to demand reimbursement from the other four. In other words, demand the four-fifths of the obligation. So that's uh, the effect of solidarity obligation. Now, <clears throat> other rules. Innovation, compensation, confusion, or remission of the debt made by any of the solidary creditors or with any of the solidary debtors shall extinguish the obligation. It will not only extinguish the share of the debtor concerned, but the entire obligation. Because what benefits the other, or, or what benefit one debtor, one solidary debtor acquires, the same also benefits the others. But the remission made by the creditor of the share which affects one of the solidary debtors does not release the solidary debtors from his responsibility towards the co-debtors in case the debt has been totally paid by any one of them before the remission was effected. So this is also consistent with the rule on reimbursement. So if the remission was made after the payment of the debt, so there must be an obligation to uh, reimburse the debtor, the solidarity debtor, who had paid the obligation prior to said um, condonation. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about divisible and indivisible obligations. So what are divisible and indivisible obligations? Well, the root word is divide. Okay, so the distinction is that in divisible obligations, the obligation can be divided into units, into number of days, or into parts. So if the obligation can be performed within a certain number of days, uh, can be separated into uh, parts or portions, and if the performance can be done partially until completed, then that is a divisible obligation. Indivisible obligations, on the other hand, are obligations to give definite things or those which are not susceptible of partial performance. Okay, an example of a divisible obligation would be, let's say, a construction of a building. A building, of course, can be performed in parts. It can be constructed from the bottom up. Okay? On the other hand, some contracts can be uh, divisible and indivisible at the same time. So, for example, in a contract of loan with mortgage, the contract of loan may be divisible because it can be repaid by installment but if it is secured by a mortgage, that mortgage is indivisible. It can only be discharged if the loan is completely or fully paid. Okay, so you have now a situation where you have divisible and indivisible obligations in the same contract. Now, whether it is divisible or indivisible depends on the law or the intention of the parties. So even if by nature the obligation is indivisible, it can also be considered divisible, like uh, uh, a contract of mortgage. So even if uh, by nature a mortgage is divisible, uh, is indivisible, but if uh, the thing given by way of security are, or if the things given by way of security are different or separate personalities or movables, then the parties can agree that uh, some of the movables that were given by way of security can be released okay, in accordance with uh, the amounts of the loan 
which were already paid paid for by the debtor. Okay, so again, the intention of the party shall prevail. Okay, now let's talk about obligations with a penal clause. So what is a penal clause or a penalty? So a penalty shall substitute the indemnity for damages and the payment of interest in case of non-compliance. So as a rule, uh, when a party to a contract or to an obligation fails to perform his obligation, he can be compelled to perform it, can also be compelled to undo what he has poorly or wrongfully done, and also the obligation can be rescinded. In either case, uh, the obliger can be held liable for damages. But the parties in their contract can already stipulate that in case of non-performance, or in case of default or delay, the guilty party may be held liable for some penalty. So for example, in the construction of a building where the party stipulated that the building should be fully constructed within a month, they can stipulate that in case of a delay, there is a penalty of 1,000 per day of delay. Okay, so that is the agreement and that normally covers the remedies of the aggrieved party or the creditor. Nevertheless, damages may still be paid in the following instances. So first, when the obliger refuses to pay the penalty. In this case, the obliger clearly uh, repudiated the, uh, the, the stipulation as to the penalty. So the creditor can go to court, demand for the payment, not just of the penalty, but also of damages. Next is that if the obliger is guilty of fraud in the fulfillment of the obligation. Now, there is no waiver of future fraud. So that's why the obliger can still go to court and demand for payment of damages by reason of fraud. Now, the penalty is generally undertaken to ensure performance and works as either or both punishment and reparation. So the penalty cannot be used as an excuse for a debtor not to perform his obligation. A debtor cannot suggest to the creditor that instead of performing his obligation or instead of meeting the deadline, he would just pay the penalty. That is not the aim or the uh, purpose of a penalty. The obligation must still be performed because that is the prestation. That is the cost of the parties for entering into the contract. The penalty is only subsidiary. It is only a penalty for non-performance. So, uh, while it is the exception to the general rules on recovery of losses and damages, the debtor is still bound or should still be bound to perform the main obligation. Now, finally, a penal clause must be specifically set forth in the obligation. So, if the uh, contract is silent as to the penalty, both as to its demandability or entitlement as well as to the amount, then uh, the aggrieved party can uh, still go to court, ask for the court to award damages in such amounts or figures that the uh, plaintiff or that the creditor can establish to the satisfaction of the court. Okay, so that's obligations with a penal clause. Now let's talk about the next topic, which is extinguishment of obligations. So we have already seen uh, the <coughs> creation of obligations by looking at the sources of obligations. We have also seen the types of obligations and um, on the side we have already seen uh, how this obligation should be performed. <clears throat> now let's look, at, let's look at extinguishment of obligations. What are the modes of extinguishing obligations? Well, every obligation must come to an end. Obligations are not created to be perpetual. In fact, contracts do not have... Uh, uh, an eternal uh, effectivity. In fact, the longest being perhaps I think a contract of lease which cannot last for more than 99 years. So every obligation must come to an end either by the arrival of a certain period or certain time or by the performance of, an obliga of the obligation or maybe because of the arrival of or because of the happening of an incident or uh, uh, an event such as loss occasioned by a fortuitous event. We'll talk more about that as we go uh, through these uh, separate individual modes of extinguishment of obligations. So let's start with 
payment or performance. What is payment? Payment is a mode of extinguishing obligations and it means not only the delivery of money but also the performance in any other manner of an obligation. That's why payment and performance are interchangeable. They refer to the same thing. It is the compliance with what was provided for in the contract and not something else or not the alternative or a substitute. So <clears throat> to, to see if payment or performance is effective and valid, we must consider these two uh, important tests of payment. First is the test of integrity of payment, which means that the thing or service in which the obligation exists must be completely delivered or rendered. So if the uh, contract is for the pay, if the obligation is for the payment of, let's say, a purchase price of 100,000 pesos, then there is integrity of payment if the entire 100,000 pesos is paid. Okay, so it's the completeness of the payment that makes it, or th that meets the test of integrity of payment. Identity of payment, on the other hand, means that the very thing, service or forbearance, must be performed and nothing else. So let's say if the obligation is for the delivery of a car of a certain uh, make, a certain brand, a certain model, a certain gear, okay, uh, a certain, let's say, uh, displacement, then it should be the same car and not another car. Otherwise, it will fail the test of identity of payment. So these two tests must be met. Otherwise, the obligation is not extinguished and the creditor can still demand the payment or performance of the obligation. Okay, now what about partial payments? As I've already said, the test of uh, the integrity of payment requires that the payment should be complete. But also we have a specific provision in the Civil Code, and that is Article 1248 of the Civil Code. So a creditor has the right to reject a debtor's offer to pay in installments. Article 1248 of the Civil Code states that unless there is an express stipulation to that effect, the creditor cannot be compelled to make partial payments. Under this provision, the prestation, that is the object of the obligation, must be performed in one act and not in parts. Now, it is quite common for some debtors to try to amend or change the mode of payment or the terms of payment or performance. Now, number one, it must be consented to by the creditor because the creditor cannot accept partial payments if that was not stipulated. If the stipulation is silent, as we have said, uh, the obligation is pure, then it must be demandable at once. And uh, following the test of integrity of payment, it must be performed or paid in full. But nothing will prevent the parties from modifying their agreement. You know, um, the parties must be realistic and the parties must be practical. If it is easier to demand payment if it's done partially than when it is demanded to be paid in full, then maybe the creditor would be uh, wiser to accept partial payments. But if the creditor doesn't believe that uh, the debtor has the capacity to pay, like what we said earlier, the debtor may lose the right or the privilege of the period, and thus the creditor can demand the full payment or the full performance. Okay, now next uh, matter to discuss is the matter of acceptance versus receipt of payment or performance. Now, acceptance has a legal connotation. The word accept in Article 1235 of the Civil Code means to take as satisfactory or sufficient or to agree to an incomplete or irregular performance. This means that the creditor is aware that the payment is irregular, defective, or incomplete, and yet he accepts payment. That acceptance is substantial compliance with the agreement, and so he cannot be uh, heard to complain of the incompleteness of the payment or performance because he has already accepted the partial payment, notwithstanding its defect or its incompleteness. However, the mere receipt of a partial payment is not equivalent to the required acceptance of performance as would extinguish the whole obligation because receipt is more mechanical, it's more physical, it's just 
receiving or take into possession the payment or the performance so if the creditor doesn't want to waive the full payment or performance then he can insist that he is only receiving the payment as a partial payment of the main or the full obligation okay otherwise if he uses the word accept without any reservation then that acceptance operates as as acceptance or full uh, payment okay now let's look at those situations where a third person may pay or a third person may accept payment normally the contract is only between the parties to a contract and third persons cannot interfere otherwise they can be held liable for third party interference so first let's look at when a creditor may accept payment by a third person so first when made by a third person who has an interest in the fulfillment of the obligation for example in the case of heirs of a deceased debtor so the heirs can pay because they have an interest in the fulfillment of the obligation this is so as not to impair the estate of the deceased next is when there is a stipulation to the effect that a third person may pay the obligation such as in the case of a surety okay who is allowed to pay the obligation or under the contract is in fact bound to pay the obligation next is when the debtor may pay to a third person there are two instances first if it has redounded to the benefit of the creditor so for example uh, the creditor also has a creditor in other words he is indebted to a third person so that creditor uh, that creditor's debtor may pay the obligation to the creditor of the said creditor because that would benefit uh, his creditor okay next is when the third person is in possession of the credit in good faith so for example um, there is a debt or an obligation uh, to uh, say a financial institution and this financial institution uh, assigned his rights under that uh, debt maybe it's covered by a promissory note so that promissory note now has been transferred to a third person that third person may collect uh, the debt from the original debtor or that third per or that debtor may pay directly to the third person for after all he is now in possession of the credit now another thing to remember is that payment shall be made in the legal tender so what is this legal tender Legal tender is the currency acceptable in a certain country for the payment of obligations in money, that is payment of loans, payment of the purchase price. So here in the Philippines, the legal tender is of course the Philippine peso. However, under Section 1 of Republic Act 8183, the parties may agree that the obligation or transaction be settled in another currency. Whether these parties are foreigners in the Philippines or Filipinos in the Philippines, they can agree to a different currency they can choose the u.s dollars they can also use let's say the british pound the euro to um, fulfill their obligations in money okay next uh, please remember that promissory notes checks and other bills of exchange shall have the effect of payment only when they have been cashed or when through the fault of the creditor they have been impaired so a check for example normally <clears throat> has a clearing of a day or two days or three days depending on when it was received or when it was deposited so when an obligation is is set to be due on a certain date the delivery of the check on that date does not operate as payment because that check would still require a clearing so it is only on the day that the check has been encashed or deposited or has been credited to the account of the creditor will that payment in check or by check operate as payment okay so the, the, the person paying by check should consider uh, this clearing process and should uh, deliver the check uh, at a time uh, reasonable enough for the creditor to have it in cash now furthermore uh, the creditor may be blamed for the non-encashment of the check because maybe the creditor has neglected to cash it or to deposit it or has unreasonably held on to the check thus the check became stale so in that case the debtor 
will be excused or will be relieved of his obligation and the obligation shall be deemed extinguished. Okay, now let's talk about application of payments. What is this application of payments? Well, it is the designation of the debt to which payment must be applied when the debtor has several obligations of the same kind in favor of the same creditor. Generally, it is the debtor's right. In other words, the debtor can choose, okay, let's say I have 1 million pesos and my debts total around 1.5 million. So where should I put or where should I apply this 1 million pesos? The debtor can choose which ones to be um, paid for out of that 1 million pesos. Now, you apply only application of payments if the amount is less than the total obligation. Consider a situation where a person is insolvent or bankrupt. Thus, we have the rules on preference as well as concurrence of credits. Usually, in preference or concurrence of credits, the credits which are unsecured are prioritized because, after all, the secured credits have their respective collaterals to be used in case of non-payment. So, generally, it is the debtor's debt using his sound discretion or maybe applying the rules on preference and concurrence of credits. But the creditor may make the selection if the debtor does not elect or when there is an agreement to that effect. So the creditor may reserve that in his contract with the debtor or maybe in the industry that is the uh, trade practice. So the creditor may exercise the right of application of payments. But, okay, um, you've noticed some typographical error here, of course. Payment shall be made or shall be applied on the principal first in case the debt incurs interest. Okay, what's the error here? Well, the error is that it should be interest first, not principal. Okay, so the correct rule is that payment should be applied on the interest first in case the debt incurs interest. Okay, so read Article 1253. That's why, uh, as practical example, you will notice that when you borrow... Uh, Principal, uh, when you borrow money and that uh, loan incurs interest and then you make staggered payments, you notice that you are you have been paying a relatively large amount already over a certain period of time and yet the principal hasn't even been reduced. Or if it is reduced but the reduction is so small or trivial, that is because the payments that were made were first applied on the interest. And interest itself, remember, is also being compounded. So it's best to timely pay your loans or your amortizations in order to avoid uh, compounding of interest so that you can really see that your principal debt is being reduced. Okay? So payment shall be applied on the interest first in case the debt incurs interest. Okay, now let's talk about the shown in payment. So what is Dacian in payment or Dacian in payment? Well, it's also called Dacian in pago. So here, instead of payment in cash, the debtor pays in kind. So what are the requisites? First, existence of a monetary obligation. Next, alienation to the creditor of a property by the debtor with the consent of the former. And third, satisfaction of the money obligation of the debtor. Now, because a thing is alienated to the creditor after a loan was made, it is as if the earlier loan was the purchase price of the thing thus delivered. And because of this, we apply the law on sales. For example, adequacy of the price as well as the warranties. Thus, in your loan sales, for as long as the price is agreed upon by the parties, it doesn't matter if the price is inadequate versus or as compared to the value of the thing that contract is still valid thus in the shun in pago or in dation in payment it is not rendered invalid if the amount of the loan is so low compared to or the amount of the unpaid obligation is very low compared to the value of the thing which was delivered remember in sales or in the shun in pago the meeting of the minds or the mutual agreement of the parties prevails over that of the commutative um, value of the things exchanged. Okay, so now let's talk about payment by session. 
So this takes place when the debtor cedes or assigns his property to his creditors by way of payment of his debts. So there are, well, compared to the in payment, session involves plurality of creditors, partial or complete insolvency, universality of property ceded, and the release is to the extent of the proceeds of the things ceded or assigned. Again, this reminds us of a bankruptcy proceeding where a debtor or the insolvent debtor has several creditors and because he has uh, inadequate or insufficient properties or funds, then he offers his properties by way of session to all his creditors and all his creditors will now share from the proceeds of the things ceded or assigned if they are sold. Okay. Now next is tender and consignation. So the distinction is as follows. Tender of payment is the manifestation of the debtor to the creditor of his decision to comply com immediately with his obligation. Consignation is the act of depositing the thing due with the court or judicial authorities whenever the creditor cannot accept or refuses to accept payment and it generally requires a prior tender of payment. Okay? So clearly tender happens first before consignation. And without consignation or without tender, consignation is premature or worse, maybe it will be ineffective. Okay, so let's now look at the requisites of valid consignation. First is that there was a debt due. Second, the consignation of the obligation had been made because of the following or because of any of the following. Number one, the creditor to whom tender of payment was made refused to accept it. Despite it being due, the creditor still refused to accept it. Second, because the creditor was absent or incapacitated. Third, because several persons claimed to be entitled to receive the amount due. Or fourth, because the title to the obligation has been lost. Now, of the four, of course, you will find something very familiar. Familiar if you are also uh, familiar with remedial law, particularly the rules on interpleader. Yes, you got that right. Interpleader. In interpleader, there are two or more persons claiming rights to a property or to some money. And uh, the person in possession of the money or the property can file the action for interpleader so that those claiming this property or money can plead and argue before the court. And the court will decide who among them has a better right to the thing or property. So it's the same to consignation because in consignation, uh, the debtor is unaware or, or is unsure as to who or as to whom he should pay the obligation if there are two or more persons claiming it. So in this proceeding, if it's a, con it's a peti petition for consignation, the persons claiming will now uh, thresh out their differences and their dispute and the court will decide who among them is entitled to receive the payment. But uh, notice the difference. In interpreter, there is no need to deposit the money or the property which is the subject of the obligation. But in consignation, there is a need to deposit the thing or the money subject of the obligation. So if the debtor chooses interpreter, the obligation will still continue. The obligation is still uh, valid and in case it earns interest then the debtor will incur interest but if consignation is chosen by the act of consignation the obligation is extinguished so i would suggest that consignation is a better remedy in case the ground is several persons claim to be entitled to receive the amount due okay the next requisite is that previous notice of the consignation had been given to the person interested in the performance of the obligation. Next is that the amount due was placed at the disposal of the court. And next, after the consignation had been made, the person interested was notified thereof. So all these requisites must be met, otherwise the petition for consignation shall be dismissed. Okay, now in these instances, prior tender of payment is excused and the debtor can immediately consignate the amount with the court. First, when the creditor is absent or unknown or does not appear 
at the place of payment. So here there is no need to make tender because uh, to whom will the debtor make a tender of payment? Next is when he is incapacitated to receive the payment at the time it is due. Next, when without just cause he refuses to give a receipt. Next is when two or more persons claim the same right to collect. And lastly, when the title of the obligation has been lost. What do you mean by when the title of the obligation has been lost? So for example, the evidence of the contract has been lost. So here, the debtor can go to court, um, file a petition for consignation so that the court can hear or receive evidence as to the source of the obligation, as to how much the obligation is, as to when it is due. Okay, so consignation may already proceed even without prior tender of payment. Next is loss of the thing due. So loss applies to obligations to give. So in obligations to give, loss as a mode of extinguishing obligation depends on the thing involved. So if the thing is determinate, the obligation is extinguished. So when is a thing determinate? Well, a thing is made determinate if it is identified, if it is described specifically, or if it is segregated from its class. Okay, so, for example, a car or even a gadget, no? uh, which is identified by its uh, make, by its brand, by its processor, uh, by its serial number. So, all these will make a thing determinate. And if it is lost, then the, thing, the obligation is extinguished. If the thing is generic, however, or indeterminate, the obligation is not extinguished. Following the principle of genus non quan perit or the genus of a thing can never perish. So, for example, if the obligation is to give support, support being a generic thing or a generic obligation, the loss of a job or the loss of the income of the person bound to give support will not extinguish the obligation. So, the person who is entitled to the support can still demand or can still sue. Uh, the person is bound to give support in order to give that support. Now, in obligations to do, we don't call it loss, but rather the impossibility of the service. So the obligation is extinguished when the prestation becomes legally or physically impossible without the fault of the obligor. Legal impossibility may be because of some government regulation making the uh, activity illegal. So therefore, it can no longer be performed. Physical impossibility may be because of some handicap suffered by the obligor or by the debtor, which handicap ha happened only after the constitution of the obligation. Okay, so those are the two, two things to remember when uh, talking about loss as a mode of extinguishing obligation. If it is a determinate thing, if it is an obligation to give, then loss of the thing is a mode of extinguishing that obligation. But if it is an obligation to do or a, a contract of service, then the legal or physical impossibility of the service will extinguish the obligation. Next is condonation or remission of the debt. So condonation means forgiveness. So the debt is forgiven. Because it's quits. Okay? So I, I, I will no longer collect it. So the essence of condemnation or remission is the generosity of the creditor. That's why it is gratuitous in nature. And it must be accepted by the debtor because no person can be compelled to accept the generosity of another. And, of course, for it to be effective, the condemnation must be made at the time when the obligation was already demandable. Now, remember Article 739 of the Civil Code, which is the law on void donations. So, condemnation or remission of the debt will not extinguish the obligation if the persons involved in the contract are persons who cannot accept or give by way of donation. So, who are the persons who cannot give or accept by way of donation? Number one, those persons who are guilty of adultery or concubinage. Second, uh, the public officer and the briber uh, by reason of the public position of the public officer. Uh, third, uh, those persons who are um, <clears throat> who are guilty of the same crime. Okay? And lastly, although not provided under Article 739, 
but provided under your family code husband and wife cannot also give and accept by way of donation so if they have uh, contractual obligations to one another then condonation or remission of that obligation will not extinguish the obligation the obligation still subsists and it can still be collected okay note it may become the shun in payment when the creditor receives a thing different from that stipulated it may become novation when the object or principal conditions of the obligation should be changed and it may become a compromise when the matter renounced is in litigation or dispute and in exchange of some concession which the creditor receives all right now confusion or merger of rights what is confusion or merger of rights well it is the merger of the characters of the creditor and the debtor in one and the same person by virtue of which the obligation is extinguished the requisites of conf confusion or merger are that the characters of creditor and debtor must be in the same person that it must take place in the person of either the principal creditor or the principal debtor and it must be complete and definite so let me give you an example let's say abc corporation borrowed money from def corporation and the loan is payable in five years but on the third year abc corporation acquired def corporation in that case there is now a merger of the personality of debtor and creditor so abc corporation now need not collect the debt from himself or from itself okay all right so that's confusion or merger now let's talk about compensation what is compensation it is the extinguishment in the concurrent amount of the obligation of those persons who are reciprocally debtors and creditors of each other so you have two parties who are creditors and debtors of each other not necessarily under the same contract but under two different contracts so what are the types of compensation we have legal and also voluntary or conventional so what are the requisites of legal compensation well first each of the obligers be bound principally and that he be at the same time a principal creditor of the other thus they are creditors and debtors of one another now that both debts consist of a sum of money or if the things due are consumable they be of the same kind and also of the same quality if the latter has been stated but normally when we say compensation is an obligation in money it's not an obligation uh, to give consumable things like rice sand or corn okay? In, uh, in in modern day uh, uh, contract law, uh, we refer this or limit this to obligations in a sum of money. Okay, the next requisite is that the two debts are due. They are also liquidated and demandable and that over neither of these debts there will be any retention or controversy. Commenced by third persons and communicated, communicated in due time to the debtor. So if, if all these requisites are met, then compensation shall be automatic um, but if some of the requisites are not present then they can house they can still however uh, compensate the two obligations and this is what we call conventional compensation so under conventional compensation each of the parties can dispose of the credit he seeks to compensate and secondly they agree to the mutual extinguishment of their credits so for example if one of the credit is not yet due but the other one is already due they can still decide to compensate it to advance the demandability of the other obligation remember uh, freedom to contract is king in civil law so they can agree to compensation even though one party uh, or one debt or obligation is not yet due. okay next uh, let's talk about the other type of extinguishment of obligation and that is novation novation is the extinguishment of an obligation by the substitution or change of the obligation by a subsequent one which extinguishes or modifies the first so novation can be done by a change in the subject matter also it can be done by a change in the debtor or a change in the creditor so the subject matter can be changed by entering into a second contract the provisions of which are incompatible with the first such that the first contract or the terms of the first contract can no longer be performed in light of the new contract or the terms of the new contract.
Next is by substituting another in place of the debtor. So here the original debtor is excused from the obligation and a new debtor will now assume the obligation. Third way of novation is by subrogating a third person in the rights of the creditor. Here, a third person steps into the shoes of the creditor and this third person now has the right to demand the payment of the obligation. But basically, the following are the requisites of innovation. So first, there must be a previous valid obligation. Next, there must be an agreement of the parties concerned to a new contract. Third, there must be extinguishment of the old contract. And lastly, there must be validity of the new contract. Thus, if the second contract is rendered void, then the first obligation is reinstated because the new contract uh, is deemed not to have been written or not to have taken effect. So let's look at novation by substitution of debtor. There are two types of substitution of the debtor. First is substitution by expromission and second is substitution by delegation. So substitution by expromission, the initiative of the change does not come from and may even be made without the knowledge of the debtor. So it may come from the creditor or it may come from uh, a third person who just wants to assume the obligation. It consists of a third person's assumption of the obligation. Now, substitution by delegation is when the debtor offers and the creditor accepts a third person who consents to the substitution and assumes the obligation. Now, in both cases, novation by substitution of debtor must always be made with the consent of the debtor because if he doesn't accept the novation, then he is still bound by the first uh, obligation. So it must be uh, with the consent of the debtor. Any novation without the acceptance or without the consent of the debtor would have no effect. Okay, now let's talk about subrogation, which is the third type of <clears throat> novation. In subrogation, there is a transfer of all the rights of the creditor to a third person who substitutes him in all his rights. There are two types of subrogation. You have uh, legal subrogation as well as conventional subrogation. Legal subrogation is that which takes place without agreement, but by operation of law because of certain acts such as um, in insurance payouts or indemnities where the insurer is subrogated to the rights of the insured against the third person who caused the damage or injury. In fact, there is no need to enter into a subrogation agreement. The mere fact of payment by the insurer gives him the right to go after the third person who caused damage to the insured. Now, conventional subrogation, however, is one that requires the consent of the parties to the original contract. So if a third person wants to assume okay, the obligation, or no, not rather the obligation, but rather who wants to assume the credit so that he can collect the credit from the original debtor, then there must be consent by the, um, of course, the original creditor as well as the debtor because that would change the contract. Okay, now let's look at uh, exercises. So let's hope uh, with these exercises you will be able to process everything that you have learned so far. And uh, hopefully you can uh, re recall and you know, using what we have learned today, you can answer these questions. So in the first exercise, we have Attorney Campos was one of the incorporators of ABC Corporation. From 2005 to 2010, he was the president and chairman of the board. In 2010, he sold majority of his shares and became a minority stockholder. He was not elected to the board but was permitted to attend the meetings by the former chairman for his significant contributions to the company. During the annual stockholders meeting in 2017, the board was reorganized and with a new chairman and new directors, Tony Campos went to attend the first board meeting but was denied entry. He insisted, claiming that he was or he has the right to attend and the board the obligation to permit him to attend. So what are the sources of obligation? Can you still remember? Okay, we discussed that in the early part of this uh, video. Okay. Next question is with respect to this problem. In the case above, does Attorney Campos have a right and the ABC Corporation's board the obligation to allow him to attend the board meeting? What do you think? Okay. Why don't you give me your answer in the comment section below and let's see if you got it correctly. Next. Julius opened a savings account with XYZ Bank in 2015. 
In 2017, he applied for a housing loan from the same bank. Last year, Julius defaulted. XYZ Bank then applied the balance in Julius' savings account to pay for the amortizations of the housing loan. Julius questioned this, claiming that he did not give his consent. So, first question is, what is compensation or set off as a mode of extinguishing obligations? Do you still remember what we discussed about compensation and the types of compensation? I do hope so. Now, with respect to this problem, the question is, in the case above, was XYZ Bank correct in applying compensation or set off? Why? What do you think? Why don't you share me your thoughts in the comment section below and let's see if you got it correctly. Now, for our last exercise, Norma's Salon Incorporated was buried in debts. And like five years ago, the salon was now facing tough competition from Bench Fix and Bruno's Barbers, to name a few. In an effort to reduce its ballooning debts, Norma Salon delivered, by way of Dachon and Pago, 20 salon seats and 10 hair blowers to its principal creditor, China Bank. The items were collectively valued at 700,000 pesos. Seven months after, China Bank found that some of the salon seats and hair blowers were defective. China Bank sued Norma Salon Incorporated for breach of warranty against hidden defects. First question, what is the Shonen Pago as a mode of extinguishing an obligation? Can you still remember? Well, you can always review the video if you like. Now, for the problem given, the question is, in the case above, is China Bank correct? In invoking the warranty against hidden defects? Explain. What do you think? I'd like to know. Why don't you tell me your answer in the comment section below and let's see if you got it correctly. So, that ends the first part of this obligations and contract series. Uh, I hope uh, you have uh, better understood obligations now. And uh, next video or in part two of this video, we'll talk about contracts. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to this channel and click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case I upload a new video. Thank you again. And remember, laging tatandaan, isip ay buksan, alamin ang patas.